Tonight, finished the Book of Acts. It's been a long time. And we really have not really just hit the highlights, I guess. We're in 27 tonight, and there are and 28, 27 and 28 tonight of Acts. Uh, last time, you'll remember, we talked about uh, 24, 25, and 26. 24, Paul is before Felix. 25, he is before Festus. 26, he's before Agrippa. And he gives a defense. But again, basically, Paul's defense always is his testimony about what happened to him that day. So he has requested to go to Caesar in Rome. And 27 and 28 are about that, but I want to see three things, really from 27 and one thing from 28, if we can do that tonight. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness to us today. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us this week. Lord, we're thankful tonight that your mercy endureth forever. Lord, that it does endure forever. For the Lord is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Lord, we are so grateful for that tonight. Lord, we pray again this evening. You'll bless in the few minutes we have. Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to come together to pray. Lord, we, we do ask, Lord, uh, Lord, I've prayed, I've asked, Lord, you would increase our number on, on Wednesday night. Lord, I thank you for all the folks who came out this evening. Lord, bless, we pray in the few minutes we have. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, while you're in chapter 27, let me just say... Uh, uh, for the few that are here, that was really good singing tonight. That was good singing tonight. We're going to start. Paul, Paul is now leaving for Rome. Uh, and Paul encourages them not to leave the safe haven. Uh, it tells us this, and I, I really don't want to say much, but it tells us this, that in verse 10, it says that, uh, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading and ship, but also to our, of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And so they leave, and a terrible storm uh, comes up, and they are like 14 days up and down in the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And it tells us in verse 21, in verse 11, it does say this, that the owner of the ship, the centurion, believed the master. In verse 21, it says, after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have listened, hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and have gained this harm and loss. Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. There stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. First thing that I, I see in chapter 27 is this. Paul said, I believe God. I believe God. I, I, because I know the, the devil somewhat, I know how he likes to get at us and cause us to wonder sometimes. I, uh, I don't know that it's true of everybody. I won't be that general. But I think that in some degree that Satan causes everybody somewhere along the line to doubt whether the things of God are true. I am amazed by the number of people who, who I think should know better would come to me, and, and I'm not setting, saying that God, Satan doesn't ever cause, get after me, because he does. And I believe that people who really want to do something for God, Satan loves to torment them, stay after him. So the first thing I would say to you is this, tonight from chapter 27 is this, Paul said, sirs, I believe God. Satan is a liar, Satan is a murderer, Satan is a thief. And anything that he says to us contrary to the word of God, we can rest assured that it is not true. 
They should have listened to Paul from the beginning. But because they didn't, they had loss of even, as we see, we'll see the ship. But Paul said, sirs, I believe God. Secondly, this. In verse 28, and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Four anchors to hold the ship. Now, if you'll note down in verse 36, then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And when we were all in the ship, 200, three score, 16 souls, 276, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore in which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors. So they cast in four anchors. Now I know that the immediate context is they cast in four anchors. That's what they did. And the four anchors held the ship firm. I often liken these in the Christian life. If our, if our, well, your anchor hold in the storms of life. What anchors? Well, I, I'm, I believe one of our anchors is the Word of God. Uh, if we, if, if people do not take time with God in, on a regular basis, okay, so I know, say, well, someday things come up, and man, life just seems to get ahead of us, and things don't go like we planned, and we, we, we miss a day. All right, I'm saying that on a regular basis. I think, I know I read this, that if you don't read your Bible at least four days a week, at least four days, that, that, the, that Christians have a tendency to fall off, fall away, come up short. It's, it's in the Word of God. Uh, God has given us every word of God is pure. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so if we're going to live, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, then we need to read God's Word. If we don't, then we're only held by three anchors. I think another anchor is prayer. I believe that we ought to pray. Again, I've said this many times lately, that people pray on their way uh, to work. People pray when it is possible at work. Uh, ladies pray when they're washing the dishes, when maybe they're making the bed. Uh, I, I pray on my way to work. I pray when I, I'm driving the bus. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. People pray on their way to their uh, in-laws, which is probably good. Uh, people pray on their way to their in-laws. People pray uh, on the way to the store. And all that's good. That is good. But again, the Bible encourages us to find some place which the Bible says is our closet. And when you enter into your closet, close the door, pray in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The second anchor is prayer. So we have four anchors. The first one is, is the Word of God. The second one is prayer. So we pull the first anchor of, of the Word of God. Then we pull up prayer. Now we're only being held by two anchors. I think a third anchor, and again, you can make your four anchors whatever you want. I believe a third anchor is this. I believe it, it's the house of God. Now, I realize this isn't the tabernacle. This isn't temple. But David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible says in, in 1 Timothy that we might know, which is the ground and the pillar of truth, the church of God, which is the house of God. We call this the house of God. We know that God doesn't live here, but he lives here. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If we neglect the house of God. Now, what is the purpose of the house of God? Well, we come to worship the Lord. We come to worship the King. And I've said this before, the Bible defines worship, worship, first time the word is used. 
is when Abraham was going to offer Isaac, he said to the servants, the lad and I are going to yonder mountain and worship. He was going to sacrifice his son. What is worship? It's sacrifice. I know it's singing praises. I know that. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews that the sacrifice of praise, sacrifice of thanksgiving. Uh, it, sacrifice means that you have to give up something. Um, I realized on Wednesday night that, you know, a lot of people can find other things. Well, you worked hard all day. I've, I've been up basically since 2.30 this morning. I said, Preacher, what are you doing up 2.30? Well, we, we have a leak in one of the valleys over there, and, and part of my ceiling caved in about 2.30 in the morning, and it set me straight up in bed. Now, if you think you can go back to sleep after 2.30, when that happens, well, you got to think again. But and the people said, well, you know, I'm just so tired, I can't, I really can't. I can't make church tonight. God, the kids got to go to school tomorrow. I doubt they're in bed. I, I, hear, I hear the kids on, uh, some kid, some kid in the first grade. I stayed up all, he said this today, I stayed up all night last night. Yeah, like I really believe that. But, but you know, we, we can find any, we can find any and every reason. I say it like David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The Bible encourages us as we see the day approaching that we ought to exhort one another. I am truly glad to see you tonight. I am glad to see Wayne and Tracy tonight. I'm glad they came. I mean, that, that's good. I'm glad to see David and Agnes. I know it's hard for them to get around sometimes. I'm glad to see them. I'm glad to see everybody. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, and, and I meant it when I said it, but I thought the singing was really good tonight. I, even for the small amount of people we got, it was good singing tonight. We oh, worship the king all glorious above and gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender are an ancient of days. Listen, uh, when we, we come to church, we come to, brethren, we have come to worship um, and to adore our Lord and King. That is why we come. It is good to meet with one another. It is good to sing praises. It's good to read the Word of God. Um, I have in times past just simply read the Word of God, just read it. The Bible says, Paul says, uh, and, 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 I, and I use that as an analogy, the Bible says, until I come, give attendance to reading. All right, until Jesus comes, we ought to give attendance to reading. One of my teachers in school said that one Sunday night, one Sunday night, every month, all they did was read the Bible in church. So, well, is there anything wrong? No, nothing wrong with that. So we come to worship, we come to sing, we come to meet each other, we come to fellowship together, we come to fellowship with one another, we come to exhort one another, we, we come to encourage one another. And when you cut that anchor out of your life, you're asking, you're, seriously, so now we've got four anchors. We've got the anchor of the Bible. We've got the anchor of prayer. We've got the anchor of the church. So when you pull those three anchors, now you only got one anchor. And I've often pondered what the fourth anchor is. It, it could be any number of things, but I, I believe it to be that we ought not to be shy about our faith. Look at, at Psalm 40 real quick. We're coming right back there, but Psalm 40. Psalm 40, and I will find that verse. I know right where it is. I believe it's verse 5. But Psalm 40. No, it wasn't that. In verse 9 of Psalm 40. I have preached the righteousness in the great congregation, Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. Now, verse 10. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. But the first part of that, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. Here's, here's a, a fourth anchor. And I, I, know, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this one. But do people know that you're a Christian? Do they know that? I'm not saying you have to be D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, or 
uh, Bob Jones or, or Charles Spurgeon, but do people know that you're a Christian? The psalmist said, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have not hid it. Being, being a witness for Jesus. There's, our, there's, there's four anchors. Now, you can make your four anchors whatever you want. But the ship was held steady by four anchors. But then they decided, well, we, we, at the daylight, they, they put in the four anchors, then they wished for the day. And when it was day, it tells us down there, and when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves to the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward the shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast, remained unmovable, but the hinder part of the sea, of, so the hinder part was broken within the violence of the waves. They, they, while they, the four anchors, while the four anchors were, they were moored safely. Once they cut loose the four anchors, once they loosed the, 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 the rudder band, once they had done that, the ship wrecked. The ship was, you know, a fourth anchor, a fourth anchor. And again, you can make your anchors whatever you want. Blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. Look at Romans 1, Romans chapter 1, real, really quickly, Romans 1. Here's what I think. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe has happened to America. Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People are without excuse. There is no excuse. I've said Many times, not countless, but many times. I've said many times, God is warning people every single day. For uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. Every day, God is warning people. You know, that's one of the things that Calvinists cannot explain. Calvinists cannot explain all the invitations and warnings that are in the Bible. They can't explain that. If everything is predestinated, everything is predetermined, and God has chosen who will and who will not go to heaven, why did God give us a book full of warnings and invitations inviting men to Christ? Calvinists cannot explain that. No, they try to explain it, but they, they truly cannot explain that. So they were without excuse, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. And again, I, I know that the, the uh, uh, primary uh, context of that is not Santa Claus, it's not the Easter Bunny, it's not Halloween, it's not Thanksgiving. But that sure makes a good sermon. But anyway, and changed the glory. What... what they changed the glory of God. Then what happened? Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own hearts. In the 60s and 70s, we witnessed the sexual revolution. You know, again, I'm just saying this. You can take it for whatever it's worth. And I'm not sure how I want to say this, but I'll just, I'll just when, you, when, when we lose all, all standards and, and uh, of decency, see, one of my fourth anchor could be this, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord, righteousness exalts a nation. Doesn't say the nation as it, referring to Israel. Righteousness exalts a nation, indefinite. But sin is a reproach to any people. But we've seen it. You know what? You know what's amazing? I find it's amazing if I can just use it somewhat for today. 
okay, not all of us, but a lot of, some of us, I'm, I'm glad nobody searches my background. Let's just we'll, we'll say that. I'm glad nobody does. But what's amazing to me is that we removed God from the schools in the 60s and the 70s, and we've, we saw the sexual revolution, and, you know, they, they what, what, is, what is so galling is that most of those senators are drunks. And they, they are browbeating Kavanaugh because he'd like to drink beer. But are we amazed at that? When we take God out we, and we, we cut the rudder bands and we pull the anchors up, and so now the, the ship is, is, a, is adrift and God gave them up, uh, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, Mother Jones, Mother Earth, Mother Nature. God is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. We went from the sexual revolution to the, to the, to the gay agenda where it says there in that the women did change the, their natural use and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, men with men, working that which is unseemly and uh, recompensing in themselves. Um, I need to slow down. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. I, I've said this, if God could spare Sodom and Gomorrah, or spare Nineveh, that wicked, ungodly city, I believe that God could do that for America. I, I, I have no doubt about that. But I believe God has given us up. I believe that God has given us up. I, I, I believe that we are the ship in Acts 27, that we are headed for the shore, and we are about to crash on the rocks. When we pull our, pull our anchors, when we pull the anchors, and then we are driven about, we are being driven about by every wind it tells us in 27 of Acts, let's jump back there really quickly, that they came where two seas met together. And it drove them. It says in verse 40, let's read that again. And when they had taken up the anchors and committed themselves, they loosed the rudder bands they, the, the, that held the rudder. They just put up the sail and they let her go. And I, I, I believe that God has given up on America. I didn't say that God couldn't save America. I didn't say that. I believe that it can. I believe that with God nothing is impossible. But I believe that God has given us up. He has let us go our own way. You know, people, people ask the stupidest questions. Where was God on 9-11? Well, the same place he's always been. But the truth of the matter is that we've asked God to leave. We've asked God to leave America. It will not amaze me the day they bring the sandblasters out to the Supreme Court and sandblast the Ten Commandments off the front of the, of the Supreme Court building. We've seen them, and whether Moore, Roy Moore was guilty, I, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even. But, you know, he, he was the head of the Supreme Court in Alabama, and they had the Ten Commandments there, and he said he would not have them removed, and they forcibly came and removed them. They removed them from our schools under the pretext of, well, somebody might read them and might decide to obey them. Oh, that would be it. You know what's so amazing? They discourage kids from having the Bible in school, but they give it to guys that are in jail. It's a little late. But, you know, so uh, the fourth anchor... We've taken God out of America. We've taken him out of America. And so now the ship is headed for the rocks. And there's really 
the only thing we can do is to pray. Now notice, here's the third thing in Acts 27. In verse, they all jump off the ship because the ship is being torn apart. That it just is stuck fast in the sand. It's being torn. The Bible says, you know, the front part was stuck fast in the sand and the back part was literally torn apart by the violence of the waves. The storm was so great. But verse 43 but the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose. Their purpose was they were going to kill everybody and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. You, you find it really difficult to figure out as bad as the waves were tearing the ship apart how they were able to do that. But he said, everybody that can swim, jump. And the rest, some on boards, and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Here's another thing. You and I are going to go through violent storms in our life. Probably the most violent is when, we'll come to the, when I come to the end of my journey. And all of us are going to come if Jesus should tarry to the end of the road. And I know from reading that Satan will do his best even when we are about to come to the end of our road to get us to doubt, to make us to worry, to get us to fear. But here's what's really good. No matter how violent the storm, no matter how badly the ship may be wrecked, we're all going to make it safe to land. Amen. We're all going to make it. Jesus said to the disciples, I always find this so interesting. Somebody shared this with me, and, and I've never forgot this. Even in the midst of the darkest storm, even when things look so bleak, you'd have to die for it to get better. I mean, it just looks horrible. Jesus said to the disciples, let us pass over to the other side. Let us go over. The storm came. The ship was full of water. And Jesus said to them, why were you so fearful? Why were you so fearful? Didn't I say, let us pass over to the other side? Brethren, we're going to pass over despite the storms, despite the trials, the tribulation, despite all the, the battles that may come our way. We are going to pass over to the other side. And we're all going to make it safe to land. Chapter 28, Paul gets to Rome. They get to Rome. Now, there's some things that happen. Paul preaches to the Jews, and because they would not listen in chapter 28, it says this uh, in verse 28. Be it known, therefore, because the Jews rejected the gospel, be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these things, these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Paul dwelt two whole years. I, I've said there are two, two times, really, we, we're not sure about what happened in Paul's life. One was when he was in the Arabian Desert. And here he spent two whole years. Now, in his own hired house. Now, he was in jail, but he was in his own house and received all that came unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the word of God. I go again. I read this, I read this tonight, uh, that Jesus Christ and all 12 disciples, all they preached was election. That's all they preached. Why did Paul preach for two years to all that came? Now, it was after verse 31. Paul is released. Uh, it says, Usher figures this is somewhere around A.D. 63. Second Timothy was written in about 66 A.D. when Paul, Second Timothy chapter 4, for the time of my departure is at hand. Sometime after the writing of that in 66, three years later, Paul is released from jail. He's already been on two missionary journeys. We believe that the three years that are now silent 
after Paul's release from jail that the book of Acts does not include, that Paul went still preaching the word of God. I, I read this the other day, again, that, that we, believe, we believe that Paul sailed for Spain, that Paul went around uh, the Iberian Peninsula, around Portugal and Spain, and went as far as England, and went that far. Sometime after, we believe, his third missionary trip, Paul was arrested again in Rome and was executed by Nero there. Uh, Schofield writes, it has been much disputed whether Paul endured two Roman imprisonments or one. The tradition is two. Uh, and he had a year or two of liberty in between the two imprisonments before he was finally executed again. The book of Acts is the history of the church, the beginning of the history of the church a history that, will, that has not been completed yet and that we are still looking out for and we are still endeavoring to see accomplished. Now, let me just say this again. They all made it safe to land. They all did. Um, I've read the judges at the door. James said the judges at the door. James said the coming of the Lord is nigh. 2,000 years ago, the coming of the Lord is nigh. We're going to make it safe to shore, brother. We're going to make it. Sometimes it may not seem like it, but we're going to make it. Father, we thank you again now, Lord, for this book of Acts, and Lord, for a well, really exciting book. I think 27 is just as exciting as chapter 2. And Lord, there, there's so much that we could glean from 27. Lord, if we compare the ship to our lives or we compare the ship to uh, the church, Lord, there's so much that we could see in that. Lord, we thank you for that. I thank you for its truths tonight. Lord, we thank you again that one day we shall all pass over to the other side. The half has not yet been told. A new heaven, a new earth, a new body. Lord, things that our mind cannot comprehend await us. May we be reminded that our enemy, the devil, all the time walking about, him and his army walking about, trying to deceive us, trying to harm us, trying to get us to think the wrong things, have the wrong thoughts, the wrong actions, and the wrong motives every day all the time. Thank you, Lord, that no matter how badly the storm may be, we are going to make it to the other side. Lord, bless our prayer time now. Bless us, we pray as we bless, uh, hear our prayers tonight. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen.